Hello and welcome everyone. I'm so glad to be with you today. My name is Emily Harding and uh, Leslie Vinjamori was hoping to be here with us today, um, but she's asked me to step in and I am honored to welcome you, our Chatham House members, and honored to welcome our esteemed and knowledgeable panel that are gonna help us wade through the tricky world of politics of gun control. And this is all happening just shy of two weeks before the election. Um, as you know, the issue of gun control and gun violence in the states has been a huge issue for many years, starting with the, well, perhaps most notably kind of making a shift with the Columbine shooting uh, many years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but it's a much broader issue. Um, it's, you know, according to the CDC, more than a million Americans have been shot in the last decade. Uh, gun access triples things, uh, triples suicide risk. And in, in spite of all that, and it may be, maybe obviously because of all that, 93% of voters support background checks, according to Quinnipiac. So it's quite a divisive issue. It's um, it has uh, you know a lot of emotions, a lot of uh, you know a lot of feelings around it, and it's quite uh, you know as I said a divisive issue. Um, but yet there's uh, a lot of support for gun control as well. So I'm going to welcome our our panel. We have Professor Ian Ayers. He is a lawyer and an economist, a professor at Yale Law School. Uh, he has a book coming out shortly, Weapon of Choice, Fighting Gun Violence While Respecting Gun Rights. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. We also have Lois Beckett, who's a senior reporter at, for The Guardian in the US. She's been covering this on the ground and uh, writing a lot of pieces about the narrative of gun control as well as uh, policy implications, et cetera. We have Joanna Bellinger, who's a political director at Giffords. Uh, you might know that this is the organization that uh, former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords initiated after she was tragically shot nine years ago at a campaign event. And she's gone on to inspire lots of people to rethink about gun control and policy and fundraise and organize around the issue. And we have Michael Edison Hayden, who's a senior investigative reporter from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, you might know that the uh, SPLC has something called Hate Watch, which is looking at hate groups uh, across the US and tracking their activities and their organization. And uh, Michael has been watching uh, the progression and the changes uh, within white nationalist groups in the States, which of course has a huge influence on the gun debate and, uh, and, and support for the issue. So welcome to all of you. So pleased to have you here with us. Um, I know that I have lots of questions and I know that our members have lots of questions about this issue. Um, and it's just the perfect time to be exploring this given that again, the, the election is really just days away. Right, so let's make a start. Um, Ian, I think we'll start with you. Um, you know, given your uh, background uh, and, and knowledge of the Constitution um, and the federal and state divide, how much influence do you think a new or the reelected president might have on gun control, either expanding its rights or curtailing them? And what can you tell us about what levers of power are available at the federal government level versus the state level? Sure. Uh, uh, guns are regulated at both the federal and the state level in the United States. Uh, if Trump is reelected, there's uh, likely to be stasis, continued stasis in uh, uh, federal law. If the, and if Biden is elected, it's by, uh, Biden by himself can't really make large changes, but if Democrats take the Senate and Biden wins, I think there's a substantial chance that we could have universal background checks, uh, possibly an extreme risk protective order or red flag statute at the federal level. Um, but there is a lot of action that has been happening at the state level uh, that uh, uh, states that embrace uh, uh, reasonable gun control have been expanding the list of prohibited people to include 
uh, people that are uh, uh, that have been convicted of multiple uh, DWIs or people that are on the uh, terrorist watch list. Uh, uh, but but also at the state level, uh, uh, there's been an expansion of uh, gun rights by some states. Uh, uh, some states have uh, take your gun to work laws that prohibit employers from stopping employees from carrying their guns into uh, parking lots. And many states, uh, as we've seen over the summer, have open carry laws that allow counter protesters to carry uh, weapons to Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And since the Heller decision written by uh, now deceased Justice Scalia, there is uh, an individual right to uh, bear arms. Uh, it is a limited right, though. It is at its strongest uh, uh, in the home uh, as a right to protect your home. Uh, but it, uh, the Heller opinion is very explicit that, uh, that it can be limited uh, and the courts are trying to determine the extent to which uh, that right can be burdened by various forms of regulation. Right. Thank you very much. So if we see another Trump presidency, there might be some stasis uh, and Biden would have to have some major wins in Congress as well to see something like universal background checks actually make, uh, make a mark or make a go of it. Thanks so much for that. So Lo Lois, I'd love to uh, chat with you a bit and see what are your thoughts on, what are you seeing in terms of how the gun issue is playing out and what kinds of narratives are moving people on this issue or if there are narratives that are moving people on this issue and what, um, you know, what might those look like? And then also thinking about how compelling and powerful some of the conspiracy theories around uh, guns and gun control can be, um, how are they playing out in terms of public opinion? So I think one of the most important um, orienting facts whenever we're talking about the gun debate in America is that you know because uh, American civilians own more guns than we have uh, people in this country, some, somewhere at least 400 million guns uh, are the estimates, so they, they range, um, that people think that gun ownership is a majority um, sort of like, you know, being pro-gun is a majority opinion in America. But if you actually look at the patterns of gun ownership, only sort of 20 to 30% of Americans say, say that they personally own a gun. Only 40% of Americans say that they live in a house with a gun. And one of the most interesting studies done in 2015 estimated that 3% of American adults own half of the country's firearms. Um, so that you have a lot of people, millions of people who just maybe own one, own a handgun. Um, and then we ha you have this, this smaller group of about 8 million people um, who have arsenals who own an average of seven, they own up to hundreds. Um, and so I think what we're seeing very powerfully on in the political landscape now is the tension between, um, you know, the what the minority of people who are very, very passionately invested in gun rights want, and majority opinions, which often find that there's overwhelming support for things like background checks on every gun sale. Um, but I think one of the things that that public polling leaves out is the extent to which the gun issue has been successfully controlled um, by a minority of um, very, um, uh, of people who believe very intensely in a totally unregulated um, Second Amendment right. And I think sort of the most powerful thing that we've seen this year um, is in, uh, in Virginia earlier this, in uh, January, Democrats um, won control of the state government for the first time in decades and immediately announced a decision that they were going to um, pass a slate of, um, you know, what would be on a global stage, very modest gun laws, but in the United States and in Virginia, which thought of itself as a red state, were um, some somewhat aggressive gun laws, including an assault weapon ban. Um, and there was then a sort of grassroots uprising by gun rights activists who organized, who tried to make their um, locality Second Amendment sanctuary sanctuaries. Um, and on Martin Luther King Day, and estimated at least 20,000 armed gun owners came and packed um, the state house in Virginia in a show of intimidation, um, saying that they you know, were not going to accept gun laws. Um, and that that, uh, that sort of armed men at state houses, we've seen them sort of ripple out across the country, um, picked up with coronavirus um, restrictions, protests picked up in response to George Floyd protests, um, to an open talk about tyranny and civil war. Um, 
so you know we have sort of strong gun rights activists who are willing to talk about civil war and um, assassination and you know kidnapping the governor of Michigan um, if they don't get what they want. Um, and on the other hand, we do have, and then uh, you know Americans, majority of Americans, supportive of of some gun control policies. Um, but then there's this other factor, which is that many Americans who don't own guns are open to one day owning them. And so I think one of the most important numbers that we have is that um, there have been an estimated 17 million new gun sales uh, in the first nine months of this year. We don't know how many of those people are new gun owners, um, but a study uh, from California estimated that of uh, 110,000 um, you know, people who purchased guns because of coronavirus, about half of those 47,000 were first time gun owners. Um, so we have, you know, on the one hand, a, a invigorated gun violence prevention movement um, that has been building power um, and uh, building support, uh, potentially about suburban women in particular, um, a, a large minority of people who are willing to um, take up arms against the government rather than see any strict gun control. And a lot of Americans who in a time of uncertainty and mistrust in the government and mistrust in their fellow citizens, um, think that a gun is the best tool to, for they can have. You know, people, Americans were um, selling out of guns and selling out of toilet paper. That's our country. Selling out of guns and selling out of toilet paper. That says quite a bit, doesn't it? Um, and I think it's just so fascinating, you know, that, um, that kind of rule of the minority uh, voice and all this that you've laid out. And, you know, certainly um, the developments of the militias and what's happening in Virginia and in Michigan, it's something that Michael would be keeping a close eye on um, uh, these days. So Michael, I'm curious, um, you know, can you say a little bit more about what we know about militias activities in advance of the election? And how are their activities influencing the gun debate, debate in the election overall? And also I'm curious about, you know, in the, in the wording of the second amendment, you know, it's, it's, it's 27 words with a few errant commas, but rooted deep in there is, uh, is this notion of insurrection. And um, I'm wondering how we see this notion manifesting pre-election and how it might transpire post-election. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I think the first thing I wanted to say uh, even though this does not answer your question, is um, that you know being pro-gun is not necessarily mean that you're part of a hate group. So I want to make that distinction um, up front. Uh, I also want to note that gun manufacturers um, and uh, you know pro-gun, uh, pro-Second Amendment groups um, rely very heavily on white supremacist propaganda in order to drive gun sales. So that has been um, and and they use sort of the same. Uh, tools that uh, our president does to stir up his base, which is um, present these threats. If you think about the 2018 uh, campaign, there was the caravan, right? This idea that non-white people are going to just show up in your living room and, and start eating your food and taking your belongings and doing who knows what with all kinds of, you know, you know, things that play on sexual anxiety and stuff like that, right? Now we have this Antifa um, this Antifa obsession, which really started in, in, in 2017 uh, with this fake Antifa civil war, which is a huge thing with Infowars, which obviously has a huge crossover with militia and, and gun fans, uh, Infowars does. Um, and, um, you know, they had, a, it was a fake civil war to, to drum up, um, you know, uh, to, to drum up interest for these for these far right groups and, and a lot drove a lot of gun sales. And there's this idea that Antifa is just coming to your house and they're going to do this stuff. And Trump is doing a very similar thing right now, which is you know, Antifa is coming to the suburbs, right? They're they're going to come. Black Bloc is going to come. Anarchists are going to come and they're going to, you know, they're going to they're going to dox your family and whatever else, right? Um, so you know, this is sort of built in. This this dynamic is built in. Uh, this this kind of give and take between Trump and these gun manufacturers. So it is, you know, so the surge that you see in militia activity, which or that we've seen in white supremacist activity, is both um, a product of capitalism and a product of, um, you know, of Trump and his rhetoric. Um, obviously, the, these are, there have been some not very good signs in lead up to the election. I think everybody has been talking about that, right? Trump said that made that comment, uh, the stand back and stand by comment to the Proud Boys, they can deny whether that was a call to 
um, you know, to do something before the election or, or do something on the day of the election, right? Uh, but uh, certainly the Proud Boys viewed it in their private interactions, uh, you know, as being a call or their public facing ones on parlor um, as being a call to, you know, show up at polling places or to, you know, prepare for things, right? Um, the, the, the Whitmer plot is, again, another thing where Trump uh, says liberate Michigan. Uh, you know, he says that, that, that Whitmer should make a deal with these people. And, um, you know, months later we find out that they were plotting to do no, who knows what with her. Um, and of course she was both, um, you know, talked about vice presidential nominee, right? And somebody who is gaining a national profile as a critic of the president. Uh, so, you know, where are we in terms of what's going to happen in, you know, when the election, you know, it, you know, I, I don't want to speculate too much because I don't want to be in the business of encouraging this to happen or kind of willing it into happen by, by repeated, repeatedly saying that this is going to happen. But it's obviously something we're very concerned about. Um, I'll give you one small example from a story I did recently um, where, um, you know, there's, we, we found, a, you know, a bunch of members of the Right Stuff Network, which is a white nationalist group in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. What were they doing in Lancaster, Pennsylvania? These are all um, folks who are not from there, right? And it's, it's obviously, Pennsylvania is a big swing state. Um, you know, it certainly uh, made me concerned as to why that would be the case. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully, um, you know, this, there's a peaceful transition to power and this stuff doesn't work, but, but that dynamic I mentioned about um, Trump's rhetoric and uh, producing actual violence in the form or plots of violence, you know, in the, the Kyle Rittenhouse thing, for example, um, in, in Kenosha um, is real. And it's had a huge impact on the growth of white nationalist groups in this country. Um, and it's something that people should be uh, concerned about, I think. Um, how concerned? Uh, I would urge you to just, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle is I guess what I would say. Sure. No, I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, alarming uh, trends happening there. And just a quick follow on question. So, you know, the, the groups have been perhaps more active and have tried higher level things. Do you have a sense as to how that uh, might play with voters? I mean, you know, some of that can that could drum up more interest in this, you know, kind of activity and you know gun ownership or or it could make kind of people say you know i really really don't want to be part of that do you have a sense of how that might be affecting the electorate well i mean it, it's, it's really really difficult to say definitively I mean, people don't like white supremacy um it doesn't uh you know or at least overt white supremacy however you know i mean this kind of this sort of um more subtle white supremacy, uh, you know, dog whistling, stuff like that has been really popular and has really been, you know, an effective, uh, you know, it has been, a, it been made effective politics for the GOP um, throughout the Trump era. Um, what, I what I would say about that is um, that uh, I, every time, you know, issues of uh, Trump's racism or his, um, you know, you know, unwillingness to deny, uh, unwillingness to disavow white supremacists comes up, it seems like a bad political issue for them, puts them on defense. Um, so my instinct is to say that, if, you know, it's not popular with him, but the, 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 the point of it may not be that, right? The point of it is to make people scared to vote. Um, it's to make people um, scared to speak up about, about um, you know, systemic racism. Uh, to, to speak up about, uh, you know, the things that they're seeing in their community. I mean, that's the reason to stoke it. And we'll see how, you know, effective that, that really is as a tool. Of, you know, it's, so far, it looks like for everything we can see, a lot of people are voting. So. Right. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, it's election season as opposed to election day. Um, so Joanna, I, I just wanted to turn to you to, you know, you're on the ground, you're uh, organizing, you're working in advocacy um, on the issue. And I'm wondering if you can shed some light on, you know, given the fact that guns are such a divis divisive issue and the moment you say gun or second amendment, you know, people have already decided what's gonna come out of their mouths next. Um, how are there ways that you've seen to really 
penetrate into the middle of this issue? Um, and ha have there been candidates maybe locally who've had success with certain messages on that front or organizations? And then we heard a little bit about some of the state uh, level developments from Ian, but I'm wondering what you've seen in your work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of this is, um, as, as we've heard from the other panelists, you know, this is an issue that um, I would say uh, in the past has certainly been something of a um, zero sum game for voters. Um, and to your point, like you're very black and white to many voters. I think we've seen that really shift in the last four or five years. Um, uh, Hillary Clinton was the first presidential candidate we've seen in a long time who's sort of proudly run on a gun safety message and didn't shy away from it. While on the other side, Trump was um, endorsed pretty early from by the NRA. They spent over $30 million on his campaign, which sort of stunted by today's numbers of how much money um, Biden has, but at the time was a pretty shocking number. Um, they were the biggest outside spender that cycle and they spent over $50 million um, in 2016, all in on all the races. Um, if we look at sort of how that has continued um, in 2018, of course, um, voters were thinking about um, Parkland and the incredible students that created March for Our Lives in the wake of that. Um, the other, I was sort of thinking about this this morning, you know, between the times that uh, Americans went to the ballot box in 2016 and when they were getting ready to go in 2018, we'd seen the huge tragic massacre at the uh, Route 91 festival in uh, Las Vegas. Not long after that, there was a, um, large shooting that folks may remember at Sutherland in Sutherland Springs, Texas at a church where a shooter came in. This was just weeks after Las Vegas um, and opened fire and a, a church service. And then about two months after was Parkland. Um, I'm sorry, yes, was Parkland. So I think what we've seen is um, this has really shifted from an issue that even in like 2015, 2016, we would sort of, when we were talking to voters and we were doing research on this, um, if we asked about it, it was something that voters would talk about their concern around. Um, it wasn't something that would, particularly the gun safety side, it wasn't something that would naturally get volunteered as like a reason I'm going out to vote. Whereas it was still something um, with Republican voters with the sort of vocal minority that Lois was talking about. It was volunteered really quickly as this is a reason that I'm going and I'm going to vote um, for a Republican is because I want to protect my second amendment. And we've really seen a shift where Democrats were turning out in 2016 and 2018 um, because they wanted to vote for gun safety. They wanted to vote to strengthen gun laws. And at the same time, we were seeing protecting the second amendment just fall a little bit further down the list um, on the Republican side. I suspect we will see that maybe pop back up on the Republican side this cycle. Um, we might see both of them. Um, but I think one thing that happened in the, you know, in the last um, two election cycles or so is that what we had always seen in our research um, was in the wake of a, of a high profile, really awful shooting, which unfortunately we had a lot of them to study, we would see that voters, particularly women, particularly um, parents, grandparents, it would be in the back of their mind for a few weeks afterwards. And it would, if they would think about how can we um, pass background checks, what sort of laws can go into effect, right? We would see um, outlawing bump stocks be very um, front of mind right after in the wake of Las Vegas, but then people would sort of forget about it. There wasn't time to stop thinking about the effects of these um, that these laws could have and that, and sort of the urgency of passing stronger gun laws. Um, this went from something that was a fleeting concern in the head of sort of a busy parent, something that like sort of stayed lodged in the back of your mind all the time. Um, and we saw that earlier this year before uh, the coronavirus hit, 
we did a lot of research of um, suburban women, both gun owners and non-gun owners, and both alike undecided voters, um, really mostly. So this was where we saw this also start to shift from just being Democratic base voters to people who were open to voting for Trump, um, but also at the time, the TBD Democratic presidential candidate. Um, they were this had become something that they always thought about. We really heard a lot of women and some focus groups talk about, um, you know, one day realizing about a year ago that every time they entered a public place, whether it was their church or their grocery store or a movie theater or a farmer's market, they sort of made a plan of what they would do. And it was some, it was things, these were habits that had changed and that was starting to affect voting. Um, and then on top of that, before the school closures, um, in the states, the anxiety that we were seeing in parents and in children about the, the lockdown drills, um, it wasn't even just what if my student is the next one to have a shooting in their school. It was like, I see the effect it is having on my six-year-old when they come home and tell me what it's like to have a lockdown drill. And they know that they have to like hide behind a desk because um, a shooter may come in and kill them, or they might, you know, if they're the fastest one to hide in a bathroom stall, they will not get killed, but their friend will. I mean, the stories of this are really heartbreaking, as I'm sure everyone can imagine, um, and unfortunately have may have experienced themselves. So this is where we saw, um, I got a little off topic, and I apologize, but this is where we saw like this, the rhetoric hasn't changed so much from us as the mood has changed. And I think that has allowed an opening and a willingness to listen to what a lot of um, elected officials have been saying all along, which is we're not trying to take your guns. We are not trying to create a big registration or outlaw all guns. We are trying to pass responsible gun laws. We are trying to pass background checks. We are trying to, as Ian was talking about, right, background checks, extreme risk protection orders. These are the sorts of things that would make it harder for people to have those guns in those instances. Um, and the public was more willing to listen. Um, and it was in the media more often because these shootings got, unfortunately, more frequent for a while. Um, I do think that was coupled with like sort of the failing of the NRA, um, partly of their own making, partly because the politics was shifting. Um, there have been more gun violence prevention groups of recent because um, March for Our Lives, Giffords, Everytown, um, Brady, most of us either grew or came out of the um, wake of Mansion Toomey in 2013 after Sandy Hook. Um, so I think there was sort of like a catch up to the influence that the NRA has had for 40 years. And we're just seeing sort of the first, we're all still in the first decade of this work. Um, and so voters are catching up as we are. Um, candidates are doing this well up and down the ballot. I think some of the Senate races where you're seeing Democrats um, succeed in really interesting places, Jamie Harrison in South Carolina, MJ Hagar in Texas. MJ Hagar um, is running to unseat John Cornyn, who is like a top NRA darling in the Senate right now. He's received over $4 million. Um, MJ is a veteran. She's a gun owner. She's a survivor of um, gun violence, both when she was a child and um, in the military. Um, and she is just so unapologetically for uh, gun safety. Um, she's a wonderful candidate that talks about this in a really um, heartfelt way and is able to say, I believe in the Second Amendment, but I also believe in responsibility um, with guns, as Lois was sort of talking about before. Right, right, yeah, and I mean, you know, I think what you've what you've just highlighted is how deep into the psyche of Americans gun violence now is in terms of how they operate in their daily lives. I mean, one of the statistics that stood out as I was looking at the Giffords website, which is a a fountain of useful information on uh, on gun violence statistics was that 60% of teenagers in the US worry daily, I think, about, about gun violence, which is a really, mm -hmm. um, a really shocking number. And, 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 you know, it's almost, yeah, it's, it's, it's something we, we can't get away from necessarily. 
and also just considering the number of of suicides that take place uh, by gun violence, um, and uh, that that is affecting more and more people uh, in in America. But I want to, you mentioned the NRA, Joanna, and we have a question from one of our members about the NRA and she's asked me to read this aloud. So, um, so just to the panel, how does the NRA influence members of Congress on gun policy? What are the legal regulations regarding what lobbies can and cannot do? And are those rules being broken or are the regulations themselves not fit for purpose? And I guess what I might add to that too is, uh, you know, if the NRA is, is potentially losing influence, what are there any kind of gun control advocacy lobbying groups that are emerging as a, as a powerful uh, as a powerful resource? So, uh, Lois, I don't know if you if you have uh, particular thoughts on the NRA and in this question. I can tackle some parts of this. I mean, I think that. Um, I mean, the idea that there are lobbying regulations that could fix the problem of gun violence in America, I think conveys more the way that the media has used the NRA as a shorthand uh, to construct a very simple narrative that, you know, the, the NRA is bad and Americans want gun control. And if we could just stop this handful of lobbyists from handing out cash, um, then America would have sensible gun control laws again. And I think, you know, that has, um, th that narrative I think is, sh is shifting and has changed recently, but I think it just, um, you know, profoundly mischaracterizes what is actually going on and what are the real stakes of this debate. I think one of the most um, important books that has come out um, over the past couple of years, there have been a number that have really tried to um, reframe the gun control debate and sort of what, you know, ask what are we really fighting over? Um, one is uh, by Jonathan Metzl, a public health professor called um, Dying of Whiteness. Um, and another um, is uh, by Roxana Dunbar Ortiz, who is um, a historian writing about settler colonialism and the role of white supremacy and guns. And what both of these books argue, a, a growing argument in the scholarly community, is that the stakes of the gun control debate are not about regulation and not about congressional policy. That the stakes really here are the extent to which America is a white supremacist country, and guns are a marker of our racial hierarchies and a marker of our racial anxieties. Um, and so that you see in all kinds of uh, actually quite complicated ways how white Americans and Americans of other races use guns as a marker of citizenship who is recognized as a legitimate citizen who can carry a gun in public, uh, who can you know, carry an AR-15 into the Capitol building and be you know, recognized and have the police statement say after the fact, well, they were just protesting, you know, they were just loud, they weren't violent, um, and who you know, picks up a gun in a Walmart if you're black and can get shot as an active shooter um, you know, just for, for handling a gun or for handling a toy gun as a child. Um, and so I think, you know, there's been an increasing recognition um, that, that this is not a procedural or a technical problem, and that this is not fundamentally a problem about money, that this is a problem about actually, you know, Americans, what Americans fear, and particularly what white Americans fear, and their beliefs about what they need to protect themselves and keep themselves safe, and what price in the matter of their own lives and the matter of other people's lives they will pay um, for continuing to have guns as a mark of white racial um, power in this country. Um, and I think as, as Ian was pointing out, um, you know, in the more than 30,000 gun deaths each year, more than 20,000 of those uh, are gun suicides. And that's primarily white men, uh, older white men, younger white men dying of suicide, you know, disproportionately in sort of rural pro-gun states. And so um, that's the, the argument of Jonathan Metzl's book is that, um, you know, that white Americans um, have guns in order to um, enforce the uh, unequal distribution um, of opportunity in this country, um, but that having those weapons sort of for the imagined fear that, you know, 150 miles from Ferguson, someone's going to come and burn their house as a protest, a black person is going to come. The cost of that is actually, you know, 20,000 gun suicides a year and that this commitment to racial hierarchy and to armed racial hierarchy um, kills more white people than anything else. So maybe uh, maybe the NRA just being a shorthand for some of the the racial implications and drivers of the of the current gun debate. 
Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Courtney Rice, and I'm going to, he's had an upvoted question here looking at uh, election results of uh, Democratic uh, Party administration, administration. So I'm going to ask him to ask this question live. So Courtney, if you could unmute yourself. Hi there. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I was curious if the election results in a Democratic Party administration and Congress, and we do as a result see gun reform, is there any way such safe such reforms could be safeguarded? Or are we resigned to a cycle uh, safeguarded against future Republican administrations, that is, sorry. Or are we resigned to a cycle of reform and counter reform? Great, thank you so much. Um, and I am gonna put that question to Ian because you, in the pre-session, you kicked off a little bit of a discussion about potential gun reform. So if you can take this one for us, that would be wonderful. Sure, uh, it's difficult to have them uh, reforms, uh, gun safety reforms entrenched. The prospect of a, a constitutional amendment is uh, very low. Uh, that's one kind of entrenchment. Uh, the, the, you can get a little bit more durability to reforms by uh, uh, influencing the courts uh, and that the uh, judges that have a broader view of, of what is reasonable gun safety regulation uh, could make them long, more, uh, a bit more resistant. But I think the, the real um, uh, possibility for uh, uh, entrenchment and making them more durable would come from uh, changing the public's mind. Uh, we've seen uh, just getting the uh, Obamacare in place, uh, people uh, learned that it uh, is something that they liked. Getting uh, same-sex marriage in place, uh, 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 even though that is now a constitutional view, the, the, what's important here is that the surveys have changed. And and this is picking up on uh, earlier comments here. I think there's a great prospect for, uh, for people to treat new gun uh, safety regulations like they do with our uh, 1930s law uh, prohibiting uh, machine guns. Uh, there's no movement to repeal that. And if we can start uh, finding that other uh, uh, gun safety regulations have broad-based support. That's the safest way to, uh, practicable way to entrench it. Right, brilliant. Thanks so much for that. And that touches on uh, in a question that we had about reform from Edward Villiers. So thank you, Ed and Courtney, for raising that question about reform. Um, another question uh, from Tanji Morgan, who she asked me to read this out loud is can you speak to the increase in first time African-Americans purchasing guns this year? So this was touched on a little bit earlier. Um, so Joanna, would you have thoughts on this maybe? Or, or Lois, I think you perhaps uh, mentioned that earlier. Yeah, I mean, important to know that we don't have anything more than anecdotal data on this point, um, but that, um, in the survey from 2015, um, there was indication that um, there were uh, there was growth in purchasing of handguns in more urban areas and among women, um, suggesting um, different demographics, people who are not um, white men, who are obviously have the highest rate of gun ownership in America, um, were interested in buying guns. I mean, anecdotally, there have been a lot of stories this year, um, not just on Black Americans buying guns, but earlier this year on Asian Americans buying guns, as there was an uptick in, um, in xenophobia uh, linked to coronavirus. Um, you know, so I think just briefly speaking, like Americans are taught to see guns as tools um, that can fix problems that their government won't solve, um, including this rampant xenophobia. And so some Americans will turn to that tool when nothing else is available. Right. So hard to really get an assessment of, of what those numbers might look like and what the contours of this uptick in, in gun ownership can it really looks like or what it might mean. Um, but just noting that anecdotally it is happening, which is, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, so I have a question. Uh, I'm gonna ask Tatiana San Miguel to um, please unmute and ask your question. And if there's, um, you know, I'm not sure who is best placed to answer this particular one. So I'm just gonna ask the, the panel to, to unmute if you have some thoughts. 
Thank you, Emily. If there is a development in the US towards stricter gun ownership rules, could that be reflected in other countries like Brazil? So Lois, you, do you have some thoughts on that? Just so a quick thought. So yes, I mean, one thing that is interesting is that the NRA um, has played a global role and in Brazil in particular in working with gun rights organizations there to undermine attempts to pass gun control laws. So I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, Brazil and the United States right now, um, there are so many parallels in our history in the ascendancy of um, sort of right wing Christian movements in the latter half of the last century. Um, in the overlap um, of uh, certain ideologies and gun rights in our different um, histories of uh, slavery and racism. Um, so I think, you know, one question for me is, if the NRA is weakened, will that have effects in other countries where the NRA has worked in the past to support gun rights? Um, but I think very much, I think Americans often um, tend to compare our rates of gun violence to Europe or Japan um, and say that those are the parallels for, for what we should be talking about in terms of understanding our problems with gun violence and the solutions. But I think actually the United States and, and Brazil, um, both of which have very, very serious and high rates of gun violence, probably are a more accurate parallel in terms of thinking of, of diagnosing what our problem is with the violence that we deal with and what the solutions might be. But the other right. thing I would note is how much our, um, our guns are trafficked over borders down into South and Central America. And we're also having an increase in problems with ghost guns, which are untraceable guns. Um, and the more we can, like, there are some of these laws that are getting passed at local and state levels, but we really need federal backup for any of them to be actually effective. Um, and that's something that we're hoping to see more of if things go our way in two weeks. <laughs> Right, right. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we just have a minute left. So if we go over a couple minutes, I'm going to ask for a lightning round here. Um, it, are you optimistic, pessimistic, or neither, maybe somewhere in between, about the, about the broad trajectory of gun control in the US? Are we trending in the right direction? Or are we somewhere in the murky middle? Or do you think we are not trending in a direction you would like to see? So Michael, I'm gonna start with you. Sure, I mean, uh, you know, it's a little bit tough to be either, you know, hardly optimistic or pessimistic here. But what I will say is, you know, I am optimistic that, um, that um, advocates of gun control are winning the, um, are winning the debate. Uh, you know, at least nationally, I am I am more pessimistic about um, being able to implement uh, gun control without um, you know bouts of violence cropping up. And if you look at um, the extent to which um, rhetoric, like as I mentioned, you know, in the lead up, uh, rhetoric has been heated, um, and that has led to. Um, a number of terror attacks in the U.S. that um, you know should be pretty concerning, and that could sort of crossover between sort of the AR-15 being the symbol of American freedom and this type of thing being marketed, and you know being used. Well, it was like an AK-47 type gun in in um, uh, in El Paso, uh, but um, but being used at the Tree of Life Synagogue, for example, um, you know being used in Poway Synagogue in in California. Um, these things are connected, and uh, I do think, again, broadly speaking, um, people are getting sick of living under this fear, um, and they are, um, it, I think it says something that the, the, the messaging from extremist groups or extremist um, uh, propagandists has been that, like, oh, you know, this, this shooting incident that's horrifying, it didn't happen at all, right? The, the false flag thing that you get from Infowars, that they are forced to you know, deny reality, I think is, you know, broadly speaking, I'm, I'm confident the American people are going to embrace something safer, but I am, uh, you know, obviously increasingly concerned about the potential for extremists to resist that in ways that may be violent. So uh, that is mine. Right. So broadly optimistic about the debate, but a little feeling. Not necessarily little... optimistic about American culture. Yeah. <laughs> 
a little precarious on the violence that might come with that. Um, and Michael, I know that you might need to drop off. Uh, so if you do need to drop off before the end, thank you very much. And uh, Lois, lightning round, optimistic, are you optimistic, pessimistic, or somewhere in the middle? I mean, I think similarly to Michael, you know, I think the trajectory of public opinion over the longer term, over 10 or 20 years, does seem like it is shifting towards more and more skepticism about guns, just as we've seen a, a lot of movement on um, skepticism about police violence um, and more Americans um, enthusiastic about shrinking police departments, about saying that maybe having a officer of the state with a gun is not the best solution to like the majority of small incidents and problems that pop up in our cities um, all the time. Um, but I think, you know, like Michael, I'm very concerned about um, uh, acts of terrorism um, related to gun control or related to this election. I think um, we are definitely going to continue to see some violence. And so I think for my question, you know, obviously, you know, for people who spend a lot of time um, talking about domestic terrorism and talking to people who are actively afraid about the possibility of civil war, which is being talked about uh, in the past year in a way that has never been talked about before, you know, interviewing, you know, a, a college kid with a gun at the Virginia Capitol saying, like, I'm, I'm starting to think that like insurrection or civil war could happen in my lifetime. Um, that's very scary, but it's very possible now to deescalate from that. And so I think my hope is just that we don't see enough violence, enough of these acts of, of terror um, to make it possible for us to go back and just let it go and deescalate um, back into the normal level of American violence, which is still quite high. Right, right. Uh, Joanna. I am not normally the um, optimistic one in a group, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say I'm feeling optimistic. It's not easy. It's not possible to work for Gabby Giffords, who was not uh, supposed to live the year and see where she is today and not be, um, not stay positive about um, the people who have dedicated their lives and their, um, all of their time and their careers to, uh, to making, um, educating everybody and making sure that people are, are fighting to, um, to fight for stronger gun uh, laws, excuse me. I also think um, while of course, what's happening right now feels sort of, feels so unprecedented and I never would have guessed that we were facing the calls for civil war and the kidnapping um, plots against governors Whitmer and Northam and the mayor in Wichita. I also didn't think after um, Las Vegas and Parkland, which felt like incredibly low points to be working on this issue that we would be um you know in a moment where our organization and whereas someone who works on the politics of this was in a place where we were um working so closely with senate candidates in kansas and um south carolina and north carolina and texas and congressional candidates across the country and um, state legislators in Texas and Iowa and Minnesota and places. So um, I do think that the politics and the culture of this are shifting faster than I thought they would, but this blowback is real, but I, um, I will call myself optimistic about uh, things to come here. Fantastic. I like that we're turning a, a natural, maybe pessimist into an optimist on this issue. So Ian, last words, lightning round, are you feeling optimistic? I'm also optimistic and not just because the surveys are changing, not just because uh, gun safety candidates are winning, but I'm particularly heartened that uh, red states are more open to passing gun safety regulations than, uh, uh, than maybe ever before, or at least uh, in, within recent memory. Florida, after Parkland passed a package of, of gun safety regulations, including extreme risk protection orders. Virginia just passed a, a package of, of gun reform. And there are a variety of issues where uh, uh, pro-gun people are, are um, a majority are willing to support reform, not just universal background checks, but uh, trying to get the guns out of dangerous people's hands. One of the things that I'm very excited about is that 11 states, including red states like Louisiana uh, and Tennessee, uh, have introduced bills to give people the right to temporarily give up their ability to uh, purchase and possess guns. And, and uh, these self-restriction laws 
which can really help on gun suicide have now been enacted in both Washington State and Virginia. That's good news. Fantastic. Great. So it's a difficult, uh, a difficult discussion we've just had. You know, there's a lot. The violence is real, um, but the long arc of this is is trending in the right direction. It sounds like, and some very positive things happening uh, on the local level around this issue. Um, thank you to all of you so much for contributing today, Ian and Joanna and Lois. And of course, Michael had to drop off for another event. Um, thank you so much for your time and your input on this. Members, thank you so much for coming along. I'm sorry, there's a couple of questions that we didn't get to. There's always more discussion than we can really fit into, um, fit into these sometimes. But uh, thanks very much and have a great day and we'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>